Are you feeding your snakes wrong? Probably not, but maybe some other people are, but not you, or me. Although I have fed them wrong in the past, so maybe. How about we just talk about it? Welcome to the green room, I'm Bob Bledsoe. Kent, I think I'm a little out of frame oh, here. Oh, hi there. This oh, is sorry. Chuck Wall. Are you watching Clint's Reptiles? Hang on, it's only 15 minutes. Kent, we just started shooting my video. I'm not gonna wait for you to take a break. Why are you even watching that? Because Clint is awesome. You're terrified of reptiles. I don't watch it for the reptiles. I watch it because Clint is a national treasure. Look, I like him too, but can you please stop that video so you can shoot this one? And I tell you what, at the end of this video, I'll tell you a secret that has to do with Clint's reptile room. Okay. Thank you, geez. Okay. We're going to cover exactly what I do from the moment that I take a rodent out of the freezer to the moment the snake takes it. I'm also going to give you just a whole bunch of random feeding tips. Also, my Lane Labs order just came in, so let's take a look at what I got. Okay, so I just want to go over what feeding night looks like here in the green room and how I feed some of my snakes and the changes that I make sometimes to how I feed some of my snakes because it doesn't always happen the same. And there are specific reasons for why I make changes to their feed schedule or what I'm feeding them or how I'm feeding them. One of the things I appreciate about Lane Labs is how bomb-proof their boxes are. Let's see what we got. All this insulation. I don't remember what I ordered. This dry ice is the stuff. Let's get that out of the way. Oh man, there's a lot in here. Wow, I'm putting it right here putting it on the ground. So these weaned rats go to a couple of my ball pythons and my retics and the black-headed python occasionally get weaned rats. These are hopper mice. These go to baby ball pythons and um, my baby retic, my baby super dwarf. I got smalls. These go to my younger female ball pythons and all my male ball pythons get smalls, small rats. Here's medium rats for the big girls. Jumbo mice. These go to Lucille and Tiger Lily, my two mousers. Except I got a story about Lucille that we'll talk about in a minute. And these also can go to the super dwarves and my black-headed python. Jumbo mice are great for them as well. Uh, more smalls. Man, this is a lot. 10, okay, more mediums. Man, I got a lot of smalls. I gotta get these into the freezer now. You don't need to see that. You know what it looks like when somebody puts something into a freezer, right? I currently have 38 snakes in the green room. That includes six babies that are sold and going off to new homes soon, and six babies that are still available. But that's really not that many snakes. To some people you go, wow, 38, that's a bunch. But there's a lot of people that have 60, 100, well more than 100, like hundreds of snakes. and so if I were feeding between 60 and 100 or more snakes, I would have to choose a day and that would be my feeding day and they all get offered food on that day every week, basically. Okay, I'm gonna let Stella go up here. There you go, Stella, see you later. So because I don't have that many snakes, I can personalize feedings a little bit. I have some snakes that eat every five days, some that eat every seven, some that eat every 14 days. And I have an app that tracks and tells me each day which snakes I'm supposed to feed. I use Husbandry Pro, I like it a lot, but there's a bunch of apps out there that you can try. I guess I'm just drinking coffee while I do a video now. Even though my Husbandry Pro app conveniently tells me that I'm supposed to feed these certain snakes on this day, I might feed snakes a little bit earlier or a little bit later based on their body condition, based on what they last ate. For instance, Echo and Stella, Stella who's right there right off camera, typically eat every 14 days, but I fed them the other day on day 10, they had eaten a small uh, quail 10 days earlier. And so because it was such a small meal and their digestive system went through it, I just gave them a weaned rat on day 10. So now we'll probably go 14 days before they see their next meal. There's a lot to this. So I'm going to give a quick overview with some helpful tips. I do have other videos on feeding that get really specific on rodent size and stuff like that, but let me just quickly go through it. Hatchlings like this one get either hopper mice or rat pups. And sometimes I change it up. I used to feed rat pups right, right out of the gate and I still do sometimes, but the problem with that is that I like these guys to eat every five days. And a lot of times a rat pup every five days is quite a bit for their system to, to work through. So if I give them smaller meals, 
every five days, it helps. The reason I do every five days for hatchlings is I want them to get in the habit of eating. I want them to get used to it. But a hatchling isn't gonna die if you feed them every seven days. Like, that's no problem. You, either one is fine. This is my little clown pied holdback. He doesn't have a name yet. You got any suggestions? Put it in the comments. It's a pretty cute little guy. Here's a helpful tip that happened with a couple of my hatchlings. This is a tip that works with any age snake, by the way. But, you know, a lot of times we see, especially bigger breeders on videos, they offer the snake a meal, and if it doesn't take it, they just go, okay, I'll offer it next week. Which you can do, that's okay for the snake. But what I do when a snake doesn't take the food right away is I shut the enclosure, feed a few other snakes, give that snake a chance to think about it for a little bit, and then I offer again. Sometimes it just takes them waking up a little bit and moving around and deciding whether they're hungry or not. So, you know, just wait a little bit and offer again. Don't wait hours, but you know, 10 minutes or something. This is Dash. He's a ball python that gets weaned rats right now. Uh, the next size up would be Smalls. But I talk about this in other videos where you want to kind of eyeball the size of the rat. And this is the thickest part of Dash's body right here. And I want a rodent that's about this thick. It doesn't have to be exact. You don't need calipers to measure it. Snakes in the wild, if Dash lived in the wild, well, he wouldn't look like this if he lived in the wild, but if he lived in the wild, he would be taking what he can get, sometimes a lot smaller, sometimes a lot bigger. We just want to give the ideal size when we can, which is about as thick as the middle part of their body. Now, that rule works really well for young snakes, but it doesn't work their whole life. So don't try to do that with adult snakes. You'd be feeding, you know, Damara, who's, who's my biggest... She's a nine pound, five and a half foot long ball python with a body that's like this thick. If I found a rodent that was this thick, that would be way too big for Damara to eat. She gets one medium rat every couple weeks. Uh, same, with, same with my males. Dash will graduate from a uh, wean rat to a small. And once he graduates to small, that is the biggest rodent that he'll ever eat. All my males get one small rat every two weeks. By the way, Dash and his sister Willow still get fed once a week. But once I move them to smalls, I'll probably cut that back to every 10 days. And then as they grow a little bit more, I'll cut it back to every 14 days. Younger ball pythons have faster metabolisms. So you can feed them more often and it works well for them. But as they get bigger and especially as they get to adults, every 10 to 14 days is a better feed schedule. Unless we're talking about breeding females and that's different. I don't want to get into that, but you, you sort of go back and forth between every seven and every 14 days, depending on what time of year it is. But we're not talking about breeders. We're just talking about keeping snakes in general. Sometimes you might change up what's on the schedule as far as when you're feeding the snake, but also what you're feeding the snake. Lucille, my notorious mouser that I've talked about in many videos, only eats mice and I have to feed her multiple mice every week. I do feed her weekly because she's taking smaller meals. And the other day I just randomly decided to just show her a pretty large medium rat just to see what her reaction would be. And I put it in front of her and she struck and wrapped immediately and ate that. That was pretty shocking to me. I did not expect that. I don't usually offer her rats. Does this mean that she's on rats now and she would have taken a rat weeks ago had I offered it? Maybe. I don't know. But she took that one, so I'm happy about that. One of my Patreon supporters, LaShonda, was asking me why sometimes your snake will switch from rats to mice or mice to rats, but usually they're, they're, they'll start refusing rats and then they'll take mice. And I don't know why that is, but it happens sometimes. Tiger Lily did that. She ate rats for a very long time, and then all of a sudden she stopped eating rats. But if I fed her a mouse, she would take a mouse. So right now she's on mice, and I'm assuming at some point she'll switch back to rats. I don't know why they do it, but they do that sometimes. Okay, I think we're ready to go through my thawing, heating, and feeding process. Let me grab my coffee, and we'll cut to this real quick. Let's take a look at the Patreon boards real quick. These are the people that support the channel. And uh, they're in a really cool community of reptile keepers. A lot of them are over on my Discord also. You can join the Discord whether you're on Patreon or not. But there are secret channels in the Green Room Pythons Discord that allow just the Patreon members to chat and to play Dungeons and & Dragons and do all kinds of other stuff. Uh, they have all sorts of other perks as well. But uh, the point here is that they're supporting the channel and keeping it going and allowing me to do some extra stuff that I would not be able to do if it weren't for them. Some other folks that support the channel are my channel sponsors, Black Box Cages, Lane Labs, and Gray Family Snakes. I really appreciate all these people and these companies. There are many ways to do this. There's many ways to heat up 
a frozen rodent. The microwave is not one of them, by the way, unless you want a carcass to explode in your microwave. <laughs> what a hilarious trick. Anyway, if you do things differently than me, that's probably fine. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing it wrong, unless you think you're doing it wrong. Then maybe try it like I do. I don't know. This is just giving you some ideas for those of you that are new to snakes or those of you who have been feeding snakes for a while and maybe think you might want to tweak the way you do it. The first thing I do, obviously, is take the frozen rodents out of the freezer. Today is not a very big feed day. The only snakes that I'm feeding are the baby super dwarf retic and Anya, my azanthic subadult ball python that I got from Gray Family Snakes. I use water to thaw my rodents and I don't like them dripping wet just because it's that's gross to me, but uh, it actually gives them some extra water. So if you do it that way, that's great. I just don't like it. So I put them in Ziploc bags. I thaw the rodent in cold water and I heat the rodent in hot water. Why don't I just save some time and thaw the rodent in really hot water so it thaws fast? This is pretty gross, but it needs to be said, thawing in hot water compromises the integrity of the carcass. And what that means is when the snake strikes, it will open up the rodent. You do not want that to happen. The only thing grosser than that is if you put one in the microwave. So cold water to thaw. Once your rodent is completely thawed, then you can put it in hot water and it'll do just fine. Obviously the size of your prey is gonna determine how long it's gonna to take to thaw out or heat up. And you'll just have to sort of get a sense of what that is by doing it. But maybe, you know, for a, for a smaller prey item, uh, 15 or 20 minutes to thaw for maybe a small mouse, like a, a, um, a hopper mouse or something like that. And then for a bigger prey item, it might take an hour to thaw and then and then another 20 to 30 minutes to heat up, something like that. But f you can figure that out yourself. You can use a heat gun, a, t a temperature gun, I mean, and uh, figure out what temp your rodent is at once you pull it out of the hot water. I use target training as a food cue for my super dwarf reticulated pythons. They are highly food motivated and I want my retics to know that the only time they're getting fed is when they see this blue target. Now this little boy is target trained. He knows exactly what a target means, but he sometimes gets so excited that he strikes the target. And that's just part of target training. I wait for him to let go, realize it's not food. And then as soon as he does the action that I want him to do, which is to go up to the target and touch it with his nose or his tongue, then I offer him the, the food, which is what happened here. A lot of people will take the tail of the rodent and jiggle it a little bit once the snake has wrapped, and that just allows the snake to wrap tighter and sort of engage more with the prey if they think it's still alive. I don't usually do that, but sometimes I do. It's probably one of those things that's unnecessary for most snakes, but might be an important thing for snakes that don't engage very well with their food. They might just drop it and leave or whatever. Lane Labs offers a size of rodent called small medium, and it's in between a small and a medium. And Anya is getting her first small medium meal today. She is uh, getting very close to upgrading to mediums and getting very close to a tub upgrade as well. She's sleeping right now because I'm feeding these two snakes in the middle of the day. So what I want to do is close her tub and heat the head of the rodent a little bit with a hairdryer. The rodent's already heated up, but really this hairdryer trick is just to get a little bit of the smell into her tub so that she'll come out. With Anya, it doesn't matter if she was sleeping or what time of day it is or whatever. If she is offered a rat, she's going to take it immediately, always. Now that I've said that on a video, I've probably jinxed myself and she'll probably stop eating, but uh, knock on wood. Where's wood? There, my superstitious magic just worked and so she'll be fine. Hey, where is my snake? Stella, jeez, what are you doing? Get out of there. You're not supposed to be in here, crazy girl. Now you gotta come back with me. Notice that when I offer the snake a mouse or a rat, I'm holding it by either the top of the body or the scruff of the neck. I'm not holding it by the tail and dangling it above the snake's head. That's never a scenario when a snake eats a rodent, you know, in nature. I mean, we're not doing a lot of things that we do in captivity. We don't do the same as in nature, but it's really weird to have the, I think to have the rat just dangling above the snake's head. There's a lot of snakes that, that will take a meal like that. But I think for snakes that are f either finicky eaters or they're a little bit nervous, that might freak them out a little bit. So I always just offer straight on, like as though they saw the rat coming, you know, walking up to them. Snakes like Anya or this little baby retic will grab a meal as soon as they see it. There are some snakes though that need a little dance, that you gotta give some movement to the rodent and, and sometimes you gotta do it certain ways. You sorta of have to just figure that out from snake to snake. But most of my snakes will just grab the rodent as soon as they see it. There are a few though where I have to do a silly marionette puppet show. 
Here's a common situation that somebody was asking about in one of the Facebook groups. I usually just lurk in those groups. I don't typically answer, like spend time answering those things. And the reason is that I'll read some of the answers and usually somebody has given the right answer and there's no reason for me to repeat an answer if it's already been given. But in this case, by the time I read the question, there were about 15 answers and none of them uh, solved the problem, in, in my opinion, or were appropriate to the, to the problem, I guess. So I did answer that one. The issue was actually something that, that Max, hey Max, come here, come here champ. Let me, let me tell a story with you. The issue is common with babies and it's something that Max here did several times the other day. And that is just that they strike and wrap the rodent and then they start looking for the head because instinct tells them that they want to eat it head first. Sometimes babies that aren't experts yet at eating take a long time to find the head. And at, during that time, the rodent cools down and then the snake loses interest and leaves. And so a lot of people are like, oh, that's a refusal and they throw the rodent away. It's not a refusal. All you have to do is take that rodent and heat it up again and offer. I did it, I offered Max a meal three times the other day because he twice spent too much time looking for the head of the rodent and left it. The third time he got it. So just reheat and, and try again. That's not a problem. The, the person on Facebook was saying that she had heard that you're not supposed to reheat. You can reheat if you're doing it all in the same feeding session. You don't wanna refreeze a rodent that's already been thawed. And you also, you know, if you leave a, a frozen thawed rodent in a cage overnight, like hoping that the snake will take it overnight, once you get it in the morning, or you know, if it's still there in the morning, throw it away. Don't reheat that or offer it again. It's spent enough time out that it's developed bacteria at this point. You don't want to feed that to a snake. Hi folks, Future Bob here with my fancy hat from the future editing this video. And I noticed that Bob neglected to mention an important point, And that is, what if my snake isn't eating head first? It's eating it butt first. What do I do? Don't worry about it. It takes longer for the snake to eat, but it's no problem. They eat that way in the wild sometimes. They eat that way in captivity sometimes. Don't even worry about it. Hey, thanks for Thanks for coming out, handsome boy. You're a good little eater. You're learning how to find that head, aren't you? Yeah. All right. Let's get you back in here. You're getting a cage upgrade too. Everybody's getting upgrades. Artful Crow over on Patreon was asking, how do you know if you're feeding your ball python too much? There's a number of ways to know, and there are size charts and things like that. There's a video right here where I specifically show what size you're supposed to feed your ball python. One great way to tell if you're feeding your snake too much, and I'm not talking about baby ball pythons, like new babies, but sub-adults and adults, if they're having a massive poop after every meal, you're feeding them too much. Most snakes, once they get to the sub-adult level, or most, we're talking about ball pythons, most ball pythons uh, won't poop for weeks. So some of them only poop when they shed. You'll see them pee every week, but if you're cleaning up poop every week, you're, that's, you're making too much work for yourself. You're feeding that snake too much. Once you know how often your snake should normally eat, you should have a really good reason for feeding them earlier than that normal schedule. And a really good reason is not that the snake looked hungry. This is a big problem uh, with people. They, they see their snake looking for food a day or two after they fed it, so they'll feed it again. Keep in mind that snakes are opportunistic feeders. They don't know when their next meal is gonna be. So there are some pythons and other species of snake, but some pythons that will be always looking for food. And if you always feed them every time they're looking for food, you're gonna have a massively obese snake that's gonna die really early. I have a number of snakes that are always looking for food. Echo, I'm talking about you. She's right up here. She's on top of a rack, been sitting there all day looking for food. She just ate three days ago. Stella's probably also looking for food, but she's not so ambushy about it, right? Right, young lady? You're not so ambushy about your about your food situation. Hi. But you are good at getting yourself in trouble and going places where you're not supposed to be. You're a nice lady, but please stop going to the floor, okay? That would be helpful if you didn't always go to the floor when I'm trying to make a video. There's a lot of ball python content on the internet, and I realize that the majority of my videos are sort of ball python centric, but keep in mind, if you have a different snake, a different species, they might eat differently. My black headed python eats almost always birds. She's eating chicks and quails and she eats twice a week. Uh, that's very different than a ball python. So make sure you're not using ball python guidelines for a different species.
By the way, Kent, thanks for the undistracted filming. Do you want to hear the secret about Clint's reptile room now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it? I will be there in a couple weeks for Clint's grand opening, and I can probably get you an autograph. Oh, I want to come! No, Kent, I brought you to Snake Discovery, and you ended up standing in the parking lot the whole time. Please, Bob! I don't even know if I can bring you. I tell you what, later tonight, I'll call Clint, and I'll ask him. Thanks. Clint, it's it's actually Future Bob. Future Bob? Yes. I love Future Bob. Oh, thanks. What, what, what hat are you wearing? Uh, I'm wearing a brown hat with a sturdy brim. It's one of my favorites. Sounds dapper. Yes, it is dapper, actually. Thank you. Uh, hey, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. And it could be a little bit awkward. Uh, you know my brother, Kent? Yes. He's a big fan of yours, as it turns out. Kent? Yes. Your brother, Ken, is a big fan of Clint's reptiles. He's, well, he's a big fan of yours. I don't know that he's a fan of the reptiles because, as you know, he's terrified of reptiles. Yeah, he didn't even come in at Snake Discovery. That's right, that's right. He stood outside in, in the parking lot. And uh, so this is my question. He wants to come with me to your grand opening, but my feeling is he's just going to stand outside and it's going to be awkward because he's terrified of snakes. Are you okay with him coming? Oh, well. well. I would love to have him come. Um, but do you think there's any way we could get him into the building? I, I doubt it. Because I've had a lot of people, people come all the time that are afraid of snakes. And a lot of why we built it the way that it is, is so that it feels comfortable. People can come in and not focus so much on the snakes and gradually warm up to their presence. And, and it's amazing how many people have gotten over their fear. I don't think you'll be able to get Kent to warm up to snakes. Can I ask you a question about Kent? Yes. Does Kent acknowledge that he's afraid of snakes? Yes. Yeah. Because the, the only people I ever have come in that leave still scared of snakes are big, tough guys that are like, I'm not scared, I'm just not interested. And they just refuse to do anything. But if I can get somebody that acknowledges that they're afraid, I can always get them to touch a snake, hold a snake, and they leave. Like, what snake should I get as a pet? So, Clint, is it your belief that you would be able to get Kent to hold a snake? Well, yeah, as long as he's not one of these big, tough guys. He's definitely not a big, tough guy. He's like a gentle soul. He, he is a gentle uh, soul, yeah. I think I, think, I think I can do it. You know what? I will bet you $100 that you won't be able to get Kent to hold a snake. I feel bad taking your money. I, I don't think you'd be taking my money. Well, uh, I, you're on. All right. It's a bet. I will, I will bring Kent with me. This nice. I can offset some of our costs. <laughs> nice. I'll, I'll see you in a couple weeks. See you then. I'm really excited. Say hi to Kent for me. I will. I will. Okay. Bye. So let me know in the comments, have you been feeding your snakes wrong or have you just been feeding your snakes differently than I do it? Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.